Hello everyone. So in today's lecture, we're going to cover two chapters, chapter 17 and 18, which are solving human problems and neuroscience in society. So how do we solve human problems that arise from problems with the brain or the spinal cord? And the first uh, topic that's covered is what's called brain machine interface, which uses EEG activity from the brain surface or from implanted electrodes in the brain or on top of the skull. And these predict the behavioral intentions of the research participants or the patients. And so this gives them control of their surroundings. Um, so they can control um, words on a screen, like the example of the famous Stephen Hawking, who has um, EEGs implanted in his brain that allow him to control which words he wants to speak using the Intel computer that's pictured here um, with a speaker. Um, so that's a really famous example of how this brain machine interface can be used to help people communicate and interact with their environment. Um, and this technology really began with the understanding of circuits and research animals. So for example, researchers looked at what parts of the brain are responsible for a rat to push a lever to reach a, re a reward. And throughout many experiments using um, rats and mice to look at which circuits or which parts of the brain are responsible in executing a specific behavior, aka pushing a lever, were then transformed into these algorithms, um, into computers that mimic these behaviors um, and put forth what a person is intending to do into an actual action, um, whether it be through the computer screen like Stephen Hawking or even using robotic or prosthetic limbs. So with brain machine interface also comes neuroprosthesis, which sounds like what it means. It means a prosthetic limb um, that is controlled by the brain. So similarly to brain interface, is implanting electrodes into the brain or on top of the skull or using these individualized EEG caps. Um, and these electrodes are then connected to a robotic arm or limb or sleeve as they're uh, called. And this enables patients to receive input and output to be able to control behaviors. So looking at the glass um, and then interpreting that to the arm to pick up the glass. Um, requires both input and output. Um, and so this figure is showing this where you have the sensory feedback um, backpacks or battery packs that um, help with the sensory feedback to the brain that are implanted um, somewhere close to the prosthesis, um, either the leg or the limb. And then you have an individualized EEG cap or electrodes that are implanted in the brain. And these communicate with each other um, for the individual who may have lost their arm uh, to be able to pick up that glass um, and maybe take a sip. But there's some fallbacks to neuroprosthesis currently based on the technology that currently exists. Um, and so these large um, electrodes are really hard to implant. Um, as you can see, this even the sensory feedback electrodes are quite large and would require um, easy access. So they're either implanted in the shoulder region or even in the back. Um, they have um, some ability for precise movement, but really it's, it's not very well established yet. So for example, um, people who lose their limbs, um, they have the inability, even with these neuroprosthesis, to say, um, do uh, writing, you know, being able to write or draw, um, as this requires really precise fine movement. Um, the longevity of these electrodes is also an issue. And... The hardest hurdle that's come up with these is that one electrode can only control up to 100 neurons. And as you can imagine, 100 seems like quite a lot of neurons, but in fact, your brain has millions and millions of neurons. And so in order to uh, capture all of the neurons or even a large region of neurons that are damaged, you would need many electrodes in a very small space, which is um, the problem that they're currently having. Um, but there have been advances to make these electrodes smaller, um, so only time will tell how effective these neuroprosthesis can be in the future. So another method to help treat uh, different diseases and neurological issues is deep brain stimulation. 
and this has been used to treat a variety of psychological and movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, and even obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And so here what they do is they implant an electrode into a particular brain structure. So in this figure you can see this little close-up um, of what's happening is they have this um, electrode that's implanted deep within a brain within the brain in a specific structure called the subthalamic nucleus. Um, and these electrodes can either silence or stimulate this region. Um, and these energy from this um, that produces either the, um, the stimulation or the si silencing comes from these battery packs, kind of similar to the neuroprosthesis of the sensory feedback um, information uh, pack. Um, and these are implanted in patient's back or shoulder area. And what it does is it stimulates these deep brain uh, regions that can help either strengthen neuron connections. So if you can remember, in Parkinson's disease, um, they have loss of um, dopamine within the substantia nigra. So increasing um, these neurotransmitters by activating the neurons within the substantia nigra has shown to have some improvement on their motor abilities. Um, and it also can be used to silence neuron connections. And in cases like OCD, what it does is it stimulates a particular uh, neural circuit by um, stimulating the neuron, but what this does is it kind of drowns out the rest of the noise. So if you think about this as their, um, people with OCD have a lot of uh, neural activity, and this can help um, strengthen just one circuit to eliminate, to eliminate the background noise. So deep brain stimulation has been used um, currently to treat some of these diseases, um, and it can be really helpful um, although it is a very invasive surgery, um, and many times the electrodes um, are misplaced, um, and so there are some risks associated with doing deep brain stimulation. So another therapy is called psychoactive therapies, and this includes what's called transcranial stimulation, or TMS, that's subdivided in two different types of stimulation. It's either direct current or alternating current. And this uses magnetic fields or lower electrical currents to alter neural activity in a specific region of the human cortex or the brain. And that's what's pictured here in this figure. Um, it's a non-invasive procedure to help fight depression, um, or other types of mood disorders. Um, and what they do is they hold a uh, magnetic stimulator over the patient's head um, that generates a highly targeted uh, energy that stimulates a particular region of the brain. So it is very targeted to specific regions. Um, and in this picture, it's just showing that it's um, activating the limbic system structure to help um, with symptoms of depression. This is a less invasive and less costly uh, procedure than deep brain stimulation, and it's also more portable than uh, DBS or deep brain stimulation as it doesn't require any implantation of any electrodes in the brain or on top of the skull. Um, and it is predominantly used to treat mood disorders. However, it's been shown to help with memory as well as attention. Um, and it can be used to um, alleviate some of the pain associated with pain disorders like fibromyalgia by using the alternating current or the direct current stimulation to different regions of the brain to either uh, dampen or excite um, the neurons that are um, overactivated in these disorders. Other psychoactive therapies that are used um, are developing new drugs to conquer the blood-brain barrier, or the BBB. So the blood-brain barrier is pictured here, where you have your capillary, and around the capillary are astrocytes, and specifically astrocyte end feet, that kind of surround the capillary and help with this blood-brain barrier by letting or not letting in specific molecules or chemicals into the brain. And so uh, researchers have developed small particles or nanoparticles um, that include enzymes or neurotransmitters that can cross this blood-brain barrier, so making them small enough so they can be transported through this blood-brain barrier. 
Additionally, we have also developed, or scientists have developed, um, using our own immune system, so developing vaccines, which generate antibodies against specific proteins or peptides that cause disease. An example of this is the amyloid plaques um, that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So injecting a vaccine that has um, these amyloid plaques then generates antibodies against the plaques that signal to the microglia in the brain um, to attack and get rid of these amyloid plaques all throughout the brain. However, with vaccines, there are really harmful side effects, and this hasn't been used um, for any particular disease, um, although it can help ameliorate some of the phenotypes associated or the behavioral deficits associated with Alzheimer's disease. Neurotrophic factors have also been used as psychoactive therapies. So brain-derived neurotrophic factor and neuronal growth factor, or BDNF and NGF here, um, are trophic factors that increase neuronal growth. They help with maturation of neurons and also help with maintain their homeostasis within the brain. And so giving neurotrophic factors to diseases or particularly diseases that are neurodegenerative like Alzheimer's or ALS, um, has been shown to have some improvement on their symptoms um, like memory and motor and uh, deficits. So these neurotrophic factors can be used to help uh, patients regain control of some of the deficits that they've lost with these uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So predictive neuroimaging and personalized medicine is the use of neuroimaging like MRI, DTI, MRS to detect early signs of disease. And what's done is that there is machine learning software that compares very large data sets of all of these scans of normal brains in comparison to diseased brains. And this allows for the detection of disease characteristics um, that are found before the disease really progresses or before the onset of symptoms. So using this um, predictive neural imaging can help predict uh, the type of disease or uh, deficits that might occur before the disease really starts progressing or before the symptoms begin. Personalized medicine also uses neuroimaging techniques, but this is to investigate the specific areas of the brain that are related to disease or psychological disorders. And so an example of this is depression. So depression can cause deficits in different regions of the brain. And so if somebody were to go into an MRI and they found that they had an overactive amygdala, they might prescribe this person psychotherapy. A psychotherapy has been shown to be better for individuals who have overactive amygdalas um, if they have depression. Whereas if another person were to go through the MRI or DTI and they had found that they have an overactive anterior insula, which is shown here as AI, which is more on the cortex, they would prescribe this person drugs or medication um, to help them with their symptoms. Um, so this personalized medicine can really help individuals get the care that they need uh, based on their uh, neurological phenotypes that's seen in the brain through MRI or DTI. So another way that we can treat or diagnose disease is by looking at cellular markers. And these are specific markers like lipids, proteins, molecules, or neurotransmitters that are used to diagnose and treat psychological or neurological diseases. Um, and we can uh, use uh, investigate biomarkers that are, are related to these diseases by looking at their genes or what mutations are causing this disease. Um, and we can also look at what uh, molecules or proteins are increased or decreased um, that indicate this disease. So at this graph, um, it's just showing Huntington's disease and all of the symptoms or uh, physiological markers that we can use to detect um, the disease before symptom onset. So here we have this symptom onset, which is in the dotted line. And then we have cortical gray matter, white matter, um, brain metabolism, and other aspects of the disease that we know are markers of Huntington's. And as you can see, what we want to do is we want to be able to catch the disease before the onset of symptoms. So looking at decreased cortical gray matter or white matter 
and being able to detect that before the symptom onset might be beneficial in order to treat this disease. Um, and these cellular markers can also be used um, as a baseline for determining the benefit of a treatment. So if we give Huntington's um, patients a specific treatment, we can look at these cellular markers to determine how well our therapy is working. Cell transplants are also used to help people with neurological diseases, particularly of those that um, have been injured or have insult in the brain, so strokes or uh, people who have spinal cord injuries. What's typically used is what's called stem cell therapy, and stem cells are undifferentiated embryonic or adult tissue cells, meaning that they're really young cells that can really turn into any type of cell if they're given the right uh, environment or different trophic factors. Um, and so these cells um, usually are given to injured areas to help generate more neurons since they are young and they can proliferate into whatever they are being transformed into. Um, and an example like in this picture is the spinal cord injuries where they inject stem cells that turn into um, neurons or nerves uh, that help people who have uh, spinal cord injuries or paraplegic. And, but there are some pitfalls. Um, it's hard to deliver um, these cell transplants to specific regions of the brain. As you can imagine, it'd be really hard to get down to the deep brain structures. Um, and it's difficult to control what these cells will become. We have some grasp on this, but we can't uh, determine each of those stem cells what they will be. Um, and oftentimes these stem cells are rejected by the patient because they are in fact foreign. Um, so your body will detect that these are foreign, will make antibodies against them, and then these stem cells will be depleted. So gene replacement can also be used to treat neurological diseases. Um, and this uh, technique is used to deliver functional genes to cells for diseases that are caused by genetic mutation, so a dysfunctional gene. And what scientists are using is non-pathogenic viruses that are called either lentivirus or adeno-associated virus um, that are able to hold or encapsulate our um, healthy gene inside of this viral vector. That works just kind of like um, a virus, right? It spreads throughout the body. And so we utilize this ability of the virus to spread throughout the body to be able to deliver our functional gene. So up in the top figure, figure, we have our healthy gene that's packaged or put into this viral vector. And this viral vector has our healthy gene inside, and then we deliver this gene to the patient who has this genetic mutation that causes a specific disease. In addition to using viral gene therapy, there's also something that's called CRISPR technology. And this technology uses an RNA sequence to target genes and an enzyme that's called Cas9 that cuts the DNA. And so here in this figure on the bottom is just an example of how this works. Um, and it is a, kind of complicated, but we'll get through it. So you have your Cas9, which is an enzyme that cuts DNA on both strands. And this is attached to what's called the guide RNA. And the guide RNA looks for specific sequences within the gene um, so you can develop or create these guides specific to your gene of interest. And so this complex of the guide in the Cas9 that makes the cut binds to a specific region of the gene, makes a double-stranded cut, and this can help either eliminate the mutated gene or um, it can also make room for introducing a new healthy copy of the gene. And so this um, is able to uh, do gene replacement therapy. Um, and, but both of these techniques can also be used to generate disease animal models so we can further study disease and develop treatments that are effective um, that can move to human clinical trials. Unfortunately, both of these te techniques are limited and they're fairly new in the field. Um, mostly the distribution of delivering functional genes to each cell is quite um, a hurdle to get over as you can imagine every cell in your body has this mutation and so to be able to generate um, enough of these healthy genes um, that get into each cell can be quite um, hard to do 
Um, and some of these, um, especially with um, gene therapy using uh, virus, um, can be unable to pass the blood-brain barrier, which we talked about before. Um, and then there's also an ethical dilemma of using CRISPR in humans, um, as I'm not sure if you've all have heard the AIDS uh, CRISPR experiment that was done in China. But there are some ethical dilemmas of using CRISPR in humans as it is not a human enzyme. Um, so this was derived from bacteria. So now we're going to move on to the next chapter, which is neuroscience in society. And most of this is discussion based. But I wanted to make some points to get you thinking about how neuroscience is perceived and how we can use neuroscience in our society today. So there are many questions that we can ask about neuroscience in society. And one of them is, how do I make decisions? Who decides what the law should be based on how people make these decisions? And what makes laws fair? And neuroscience can provide the evidence-based arguments for how to build a society rooted in a solid understanding of brain science. And so these answers require really critical thinking about how the human mind works. So neuro law is a field that combines both neuroscience and law practice. And so some of the questions that neuro law um, has or what these lawyers ask in terms of how it relates to the brain and how people make decisions is, you know, taking drugs or being addicted to drugs, is this just a bad decision? Or is it a symptom of a disease? And should they continue to be jailed? Should they receive therapy or rehabilitation to treat this disease or um, this uh, addiction? Or maybe both. Um, and so to prompt a little discussion or to get you to think about um, neural law in terms of how it relates to society and neuroscience is um, a man had brain surgery to remove a, a tumor. And after the surgery, he developed a compulsion to view child pornography. This doctor provided evidence that the surgery had damaged a part of the brain that typically suppresses dark urges. So do you think he should be punished for looking at child pornography? Do you think that he should undergo treatment for um, what had happened to him? And do you, do you think that this is truly his fault? Or is this um, like a disease? And so these are the questions that neuro lawyers ask or bring forth to the court in order to understand where um, people fall from making good choices or make bad choices. Um, and so again, these is not really um, topics to remember, but it's just to get you thinking about how neuroscience plays a role in society. So with continued research um, and being able to understand how the mind works and what affects how we think and how we act, in the near future, neuroscience could potentially have the tools needed to design a better and more inclusive system. Um, and so recently, polygraphs have not been allowed in courts because they have been shown to be very unreliable. And in fact, serial killers and sociopaths are actually very good at passing polygraphs, even though they are really good at lying and oftentimes do lie or don't tell the whole truth or manipulate people into thinking that what they're saying is the truth. Um, and so polygraphs have been scrapped from being used um, to convict somebody of a crime. Additionally, study of unconscious bias and discrimination has been used to prevent prejudices in hiring, um, but also in different fields of law, um, as what's currently going on in the country today, um, in terms of these prejudices, prejudices against uh, minority races um, with police officers. And so understanding the brain and how we are all biased and being aware of this bias can help us create a better future and a better society for everyone to live. And of course, what comes with this chapter of neuroscience and society is the ethics and the future of neuroscience. So to prompt you with some questions that don't have right or wrong answers, but are always constant ethical dilemmas in our society. So is it ethical to alter an unborn child's genetics to cure autism? Is it acceptable to pre-treat this Huntington's disease with, a, with genetic alterations um, by using those gene therapy tools that I had described in the previous chapter? 
is genet genetically altering children to make them smarter really ethical? And should medical professionals take steps to treat a disease or disorder that currently shows no symptoms and may, ne may never materialize? So these are just some of the ethical dilemmas that are currently ongoing. And of course, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but these are the things that technology is bringing forth. As technology advances, we have harder and harder choices to make in terms of what is, what is right and what is wrong. And each of these um, situations are very complex and require looking at all aspects and perspectives of each of these topics. And to further think about these uh, topics and these ethical questions is who would get access to these enhancements? Would it only be the rich and powerful? Would there be some sort of system that would allow for those of lower economic statics, lower economic status to be able to get these enhancements? And that's a whole other complex situation that is currently ongoing, particularly with healthcare. Um, as we know, if you have, uh, or from a higher economic status or level, you're more apt to have more opportunities to get effective treatments than if you were from a lower economic status. So as you're sitting and listening to this lecture, and you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm not a scientist, or I, I don't know if I'm going to study neuroscience. There are actually things that you can do that can help um, these ethical dilemmas. And one of them is to continue the dialogue between neuroscientists and society. So your views, even though you're not a scientist or a neuroscience, will help us as scientists understand the perspectives of the people that we're trying to help with our treatments. We also can hold forums that will help us communicate with a larger population of people. Um, and we can keep up with neuroscience in the media by allowing for better communication between our research um, and what people understand about our research. And so there's many things that we can do to create a better um, society uh, for all um, and to include neuroscience in this as this is uh, the study of how we behave and this is directly related to society. And so I hope that this short little chapter gets you to think about what you've learned so far and how this can apply to society in general and how it might change your perspectives on how you treat people or how you view people based on all of the things that you know could be wrong with somebody's brain. And so I think these aspects are really important to think about um, as, you, as you continue on in your education and in your everyday life. Once again, thanks so much for listening to this lecture on solving human problems and neuroscience in society. And we'll see you all in a couple weeks for the mock brain bee. Um, so get your studying on and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you.